um, yeah, we have Anthony Orisis, 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 um, of Rare Cut. He's the founder of Rare Cut, and obviously you're sporting one right now. Got to be the brand. You know how it goes, Katia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, brand. okay. I'm not even gonna say the tagline. I need you to say the tagline because it's absolutely epic. Sure. Oh, absolutely. So yes, um, the company's name is Rare Cut, and our tagline is "It stays up because no matter how you bend, twist, or fold it." We have a memory metal in the center, so it gives it the ability to retain its shape. So when you put it in your pocket, as you were alluding to, it stays up. So we found that to be a very good tongue-in-cheek kind of tagline, and it just works. So say, and, and it's one like... of those things that people seem to remember, yeah. Uh, even sometimes more than the company name. So we like running with that. Which is not bad. You know, if you're, I mean, I guess the Google search would be maybe a little <laughs> questionable if you like only remember the tagline. Um, yeah. Do you guys do like a big Movember? campaign or anything if like there's an easy sponsorship in there somewhere for sure so we yeah. haven't so what we we actually focused our concentration on last year uh was breast cancer awareness month and then that was kind of a, a very common question that we got was all right are you doing anything for november yeah we're like ooh, no but we will so this year we're gonna un unveil something uh in the near future um because one of the things we're trying to do we have a lot of flexibility in this brand and just kind of for me to start a brand, I was always like, I want part of the beauty of being the founder of your own company is kind of doing whatever you want. And, um, no apologies. With this, yeah, I wanted to say, Hey, listen, you know, the rules are, there are no rules. And, you know, somebody might say, Hey, what does breast cancer awareness in a pocket square company have to do with one another? It doesn't have to, but in this day and age, anything can be made into a hybrid. Um, we did, uh, we collaborated with small business owners in New York city. Um, and we had a, how do you stay up because of the tagline, how do you stay up during these hard times, uh, in regards to business owners struggling during, um, during COVID and the pandemic. And we just interviewed them and they were wearing our signature, uh, pocket square for that campaign. And we put our money where our mouth was where we, uh, donated a portion of the proceeds to the barstool fund. Okay. And that's one of those things like even though we're not just a company that sells pocket squares, we're really more of a brand. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we get repeat customers. I think that's why people get excited about a company like ours is because we're doing more than just selling a product. We're more than yeah. that. And people are going to see as this continues to grow, you're going to see the expansion of the brand in, in a lot of different areas. So um, it's amazing to have done this so long and, and get such positive feedback for, you know, like I guess a, a company that just, you know, sells pocket squares, but once they get to know us, they see we're, we're much more than just that. Right. And you know, you're from New York, so you obviously saw, saw a lot of the downfall of the small business in the last couple of years, which has been just hard to watch in general, but I feel like New York got especially hit, um, in general. When did you found rare, rare cut? So, uh, this is actually my pandemic baby. So I had this, this <laughs> okay. baby in the heart of the pandemic now. Um, I had planned to launch, uh, on Kickstarter the year prior in my head, I was like nine, nine, like 2019. Correct. Yeah. So nine, nine, 19, for whatever reason, just had a good ring to it for me. And I was like, I'm going to make it happen on this day. No matter what I went to Greece that summer, which for a cousin's wedding, I could not, it, it's very hard to do that and launch a brand and be away. Even though I was by the beach with very spotty Wi-Fi, I didn't get as much done as I wanted to, to say the least. And I was so helping on this day when I spoke to other founders and they go, listen, the day itself is not important. It's more so that you feel comfortable and right. launching on that day, push it back. So I did, I pushed it to March. And then in March of 2020, as we all know, is where the world pretty much found out what COVID was. Yeah. So uh, ended up being a year later, pretty much than the original anticipated start date. So it was September, 2020, where, as you know, everyone, including the founder himself, was wearing sweats on a regular basis. We couldn't even go out if we wanted to. So I was like, how is this going to work out? To sell yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like a fashion accessory in the middle of a pandemic. It, it's a risky move, but I felt like I had to make the move. Uh, it was almost like a now or never thing. And it was just mm -hmm. eating at me that I, we hadn't launched. I go, you know what, let's, let's just go for it and see how it goes. And it's, it's, it's a move and a gamble. I'm glad I made. So what was happening in that time before launching when you have this you're like i have the date so pretty much i'm going to launch this whole company it's gonna be great but what were the processes is this this i'm assuming this was your first like founder true company that you've launched so how did you even know the steps that you had to take to make this 
idea or reality? Nothing can quite prepare you for launching your own business like launching your own business. Um, I've watched at that point, every episode of Shark Tank, I've listened to all the podcasts, I read all the books, I spoke to founders, I went to founders meetings on a weekly basis, and nothing prepares you for doing it like doing it. So there's really no, you can read, like I said, you can do all that homework and nothing is going to really give you, you're never even going to feel fully prepared. You're going to go into it like, crap, I don't really know what I'm doing, but that's very natural. Um, right. So long as you have good people in your corner and you're willing to make mistakes and not be so hard on yourself, it's inevitable. You're going to screw up. You're going to make mistakes. Um, so long as you don't repeat the mistakes, it's kind of part of the process. Right. So what were kind of those early mistakes that you first identified of? I had no idea. No one prepared me for this moment. Well, I guess the 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 two or three failed launch uh, <laughs> launch dates. That was maybe the first. Um, I remember when I first came up with the concept. We're, we're talking now in like 2016 was when I came up with the idea. Okay. And I remember talking to a, a patent attorney and she's like, so when do you think you're going to have this product out? And I go, I would say probably six to eight months oh. top. <laughs> I had no like, idea. Easy. I'm like in Bloomingdale's at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. I had no clue. Uh, because just to like create something from scratch and like you want it to be a certain way, that takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, so nothing can quite prepare me for um, how much back and forth there was to create this product. Uh, in addition to, um, I mean, a lot of people will be like, uh, when you're working with them, they want to get the project done. So whether it's right. an engineer or producer, they'll be like, it's good enough. But you in your heart know what's good enough. And, and you're not a designer, correct? I'm not a designer. I have no background in this whatsoever. No engineering, um, no fashion background, nothing like that. Not at all. And even still, I, I actually told the story the other day. People are like, oh, are you like a fashion guru now? I go, listen, I wouldn't say so. I go, if you ask ex-girlfriends of mine a few years back, they'd be like, he's in fashion. He wore the same three hoodies for an entire winter. <laughs> and and I, I keep things simple. I went to uh, a, a store and I'm not kidding you. I bought this shirt and I fit nice. I'm like, Oh, They're like we're having a special on these. I go, how many colors? She's like 12. I'm oh like, my God. I think all the colors. <laughs> <laughs> so, You're like, I got it. Let's I, roll. Exactly. So I like to keep things simple, which is kind of why I think I'm the right person for this company mm -hmm. to face because we took something like a pocket square, which most guys have no idea how to fold them and how to like get them Keep to stay up. up or to <laughs> stay in place. And, you know, we just took a pre-existing um, concept and we just improved it and we made it easier. So it kind of falls into, uh, I think I get the average guy in not understanding or wanting to do another little extra thing. But well, I will say in having worn these for many years, it's the little extra that makes you separate from the pack. Yep. And that goes across yep. everything in life, whether you're wearing yep. a jacket without one to having one, all of a sudden that little extra effort you put in kind of shows like, oh, this person cares about the details. And when you pay attention to the details, it kind of, I'd say it almost defines you in a, or puts you in a different light of someone that cares about the little things. Yep. And there's that expression, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So when someone cares about the little details of whether it's an outfit or how they do really anything, it, it kind of speaks to their character. So mm -hmm. um, we kind of help guys in, in, in that regard, just making things a, a little more simple. Yeah, I so I actually worked in, on like the cusp of menswear for a long time. And I love menswear because it is just that one thing that can either define or break like an entire outfit. And I think the pocket square is like the classic perfect accessory to accomplish that. Um, where you're like, hey, your, your blazer, your t-shirt looks great, but you just add that one little moment and you pull together a soul something and it's like people actually notice that and they make you they want to comment on it and i feel like in women's fashion it's more of the full everything and menswear is just like if you nail one thing if you have like the most bomb socks and you've got these great shoes that show it off too you're like that guy's got it going on like it just communicates a whole like i need to go talk to this person for sure it, it will to your point it's, it's a talking piece right mm -hmm. so um one thing I even tell like a lot of my my buddies who like myself include single guy but I go have one of these I swear like have something a little bit different and sometimes when you're trying to get to know somebody there you're you're reaching for things to discuss yeah, yeah. and like oh that has little anchors on it or a little evzoness or has little whatever it may be 
it's just something fun. It kind of shows a little bit of, of uh, a lighthearted personality um, to you. And like what you were saying about like how, you know, menswear has, uh, you know, women's fashion is a whole different beast. I can't mm-hmm. even comment on that. I'm not qualified <laughs> to, but with men's fashion, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a whole different beast. But with men's fashion, one thing that we notice is, you know, um, certain things do not go out of style and certain things um, are coming are kind of like going out of fashion. One of those being the traditional tie. Yep. Now, I don't even mind wearing a tie for the right occasion, but like at, right now I have my, my sports jacket on pocket square, of course, and underneath a t-shirt, but it's a, it's a sharp look. Whereas I think many years, not even many years ago, just a few years ago, people wouldn't really experiment with a look like this. They weren't sure guys need to really be told, Hey, this, this works. And you're seeing even in more um, formal situations or even dates, mm-hmm. for example, this kind of being the look. So while the tie is going out of fashion, we look at this at rare cut as a phenomenal opportunity to say, Hey, yeah, you know what you want to have, you don't want to have your, your neck squeezed by a collar yeah. or, a t-shirt or an open collar. But if you do want to add a hint of personality, try a pocket square. And if you're at it while you're at it, have it be a rare cut pocket square, but yeah. that's just our bias. It's so funny because I it I just remember growing up, like what do you do for Christmas? I was like buy my dad a tie, because and he also like wore it to work. So but now, he would never wear or like I, most men don't wear ties to work. So right. it's just like a weird thing. But you're right, like a pocket square you can throw into any type of setting, and it's it's a whole deal. Um, where did the name come from? Okay, so rare cut. I always said that if I was going to start a business, I wanted to do something that was different than than other branding and other companies. And basically when I was trying to formulate a name, I was kind of like, all right, I want it to be someone who feels like they are a rare breed, but also cut from a different cloth. So rare breed and cut from a different cloth, we got rare cut. Was that the first name that you came up with or were there multiple Um, things that came in the mix? It was actually the the second, believe it or not. So it didn't take, it didn't take many. Like I remember I, I loved so rare breed came first and I'm like, Oh, is that taken? It actually is. Okay. So I put rare blank. I'm like, and, and I kept coming up with horrible second words. And I was like, all right, instead of forcing one, why don't you describe what you want? And mm-hmm. as I was having a, with a buddy, actually, I was saying, all right, you know what I'd like, I like it, you know, for someone that rocks our stuff, wanted to be cut from a different cloth. And I'm like rare cloth, rare, <laughs> I'm like a oh, rare cut. I'm like, that's a, that's a dope mm-hmm. name. So we took it, ran with it. And, uh, yeah, I, I we get we get a good uh, response to the name too. I'm I'm okay. I'm satisfied with it. Yeah, well, you had like a very interesting and quick response to the initial like fundraising round, which came via Kickstarter. Um, you know, I think raising money as a founder is one of the most daunting tasks, especially if you're not if you've never done it before, like where to look, do you go investors? Do you do, I I think some people don't even know that Kickstarter is really an option. I personally didn't really even realize it because I'm like, why would anyone find this? Um, So walk us through that process a little bit of what got you there. Right, so I think in the beginning, I wanted just to, so I'll say this, I'm not promoting Kickstarter the company, but I am promoting crowdfunding as a really great options for not all companies, but certain types of companies. Um, if you're trying to like, if someone had a jewelry company per se, I wouldn't necessarily say go the Kickstarter route. Um, you could, but I think for us being that we were a newer concept, uh, we wanted to, uh, test that concept out and see, is there a demand for this? Is there a need for it? Uh, before we go full blown out, uh, launch, let's test it out. And it ended up being a great thing for us. So um, crowdfunding, just in a nutshell, is for those are, who are not familiar, it gives you a chance to almost pre-sale, uh, pre-sell your product. So you say, hey, we have a working prototype. You put together a video, you introduce to the world what your uh, concept's all about, what you're all about, what your vision's all about. And you're basically selling them on the future of your company. And instead of going like series A, series B, you're kind of going to the public and saying, hey, uh, pre-purchase now. And if you do, you'll be the first to get something, which a lot of people do want to be the first to have certain things. You'll get a a good discount. 
and you'll stay in the loop uh, for uh, the duration of this company. You're going to get updates, probably some future coupon codes. So it keeps people invested. It's almost like you have a lot of good music in LA. Like when you see a band on a small stage, like maybe you go to like Whiskey A Go Go and you see a band, you're like, this band rocks. And you're like, they're amazing. And then two years later, you're like, that was the Black Keys who I saw. They yeah. were incredible. It's like discovering something or someone prior to it blowing up and people feel really invested when they were the first two. They become essentially your biggest fans. Okay. So that's what crowdfunding is in general. And it's also very forgiving. And what I mean by that is when you are starting a company, you, there's gonna be so many things that you did not foresee, like uh, uh, manufacturing, production mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. shipping. Uh, it, it's a whole lot. And especially, I, I always say this, entrepreneurship is it is it's extremely tough it's rewarding but it's extremely tough but solopreneurship is infinitely tougher so i had to get my family so you're involved fully by yourself like you don't have yeah. a business partner okay i don't have a business partner but I, I always say we because i have other people that i i have a manufacturer who i consult with i had a consultant for a short time i have designers i have a lot of people that are part of a bigger team but as far as like partnership goes it's it's just me so you're making all the decisions. So you're like, if I fuck up, like it's on me. It's uh, it's always yeah. yeah. It's always on me. Yeah, you you own it no matter what. But I'm it, assuming you me. have like a group, like you said, your family or a sounding board that you're like, hey, welcome to my board meeting, aka dinner, <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you everything I'm gonna do. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I think I think part of the bigger picture will be uh, potentially a uh, strategic partner. There's a few companies. Oh, I won't say on air, but there's a few companies I think collaborating with would be just a complete game changer for our, for our brand. Um, but no, it's just me. And even doing, like I was saying with Kickstarter, uh, I went into it with support of a uh, family and the consultant okay. and all that stuff. But when I actually launched, I mean, I told people about this for years. And what I mean by that is I would, through Instagram, I'd be like, hey guys, we're... I'm starting this company and here's what's going on. And Hey, do you like pattern one or two more? Or, okay. Hey guys, I'm here at a fabric shop and I have no idea what I'm doing. And people got a kick out of that because it was raw. It was real. Yeah. Like this guy's in over his head, but Hey, good for him for trying. And I think what happened was if you spoke to me throughout those years, when people asked like, Hey, what's up, man? Like, what are you up to? I would tell them. And that all led to the launch date. So when it was like the launch date, a few days prior, I go, Hey guys, I sent the message to pretty much everyone I knew. I go, Hey, remember in the past, we had a conversation about rare cut. Well, that big moment's actually happening and it's happening tomorrow at this time. And people are like, yo, that's amazing. And I'm like, do you, is it cool if I send you a calendar invite and with a link there once we okay. go live and pretty much every single person said, absolutely. And I got to tell you the people that like came through was just like, I actually love, you can't see because of the jacket. I have like chills in my arms just saying it because so many people from all walks of life were like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support you and came yeah. through. And it's just like, it was very touching to be quite honest with you. Um, we, in 30 days, we we did over 50K in sales for wow. a lower marked item. Sure. You know what I mean? Some And how many designs did you have on there? At that time, I believe we had 24, I want to say. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It's oh a my lot. god! Yeah, but the but the beauty was because we did Kickstarter is we knew what they wanted ahead of time. Sure, so you could drop ship. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. We, we didn't do drop shipping, so to speak, but we created a process. Um, you 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 learn throughout the the process, right? We have a new way of pro of making this product, which is like happened through dumb luck. To be honest, we just got very very lucky in our manufacturing process and through errors we actually found a better way to do it. So we can print on demand now. So why that's important is we cut back on inventory and let's just say there's a pattern that I love. Maybe it's this one, right? It's still, yeah. uh, maybe it's this one right here. What is I that? think this is going to be up to the camera. I'm sorry. Throw that up to the camera. What is it? Oh, this was a little, yeah, it's, uh, this was like a little Hawaiian file. Okay. Maui, Wowie, we call it. So Maui, again, we have Hawaiian names. Love yeah. <laughs> um, so if let's just say, I think that one's going to be a top seller. And I'm like, mm -hmm. let's get hundreds of these, let's do this. And then we present it to the public and no one's feeling it. 
Now we're stuck with hundreds of, of in your of, house. Of, I'm assuming. Things. Yeah. My garage. Everything yeah. in my garage. Yeah. yeah. And it's a very, I mean, when I talk and, and I kind of love it to be honest, like I love that we're very like, we're gritty. Like mm -hmm. we, everything mm -hmm. is made. I mean, it's not, it's, it's manufactured. The product is manufactured in New Jersey, but it's printed in my garage in Astoria, Queens. So we okay. are a startup as startup is not forever. But Straight for up now, garage. I love it. But yeah, I, you know, I, I, and I like the grittiness of it. And I think yeah. people, when they get, when they see behind the scenes, they're like, oh, wow. Every time I place an order, you're putting, you're putting Anthony to work. Yes, you are. But Anthony, wait, want. that's content <laughs> right there. Like this, I need to see, like put Anthony to work. That's, yeah. I love that. Yeah. That should be a skit act. Yeah, it that's should. Like a little thing we do for We're TikTok doing little stuff. branding ideas here. I love it. A little workshop, <laughs> see, you. board meeting. Um, that's you know, it, the power of a team. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you mentioned like when talking about your idea and talking about your brand for a long time before you actually launched. And I think that's really interesting because I feel like a lot of founders have that issue of it hasn't launched or it's just a concept. It's just an idea. So when someone asks, oh, what do you do? It's easy to s quickly say whatever your daytime job or whatever, like your most your highest paycheck, whatever that is. But there's actually so much more power in actually saying what you are creating, especially as a founder, because people are interested in like, if you're just like, oh, I you know have this nine to five job, there's not many follow-up questions. But if you have this concept, people are way more amped to, to like be intrigued and want to support you. But it is very, it's hard on your ego to admit that if something hasn't launched. So that's really cool that you were able to like get to that point really quickly. Um, and just share you're, the idea. You're, you're dead on. So it's so, I had this conversation literally uh, an hour and a half before uh, we sat down to, to talk here. Um, someone asked me like, Hey, how's life? How's rare cut? And, and we're talking about it. And then I told them uh, I had to do some, some things for my medical device job. They go, you're in medical devices? I'm like, yeah. They're like, how long? I go, oh, in medical in general, I th 15 years. Like, you're in medical? I'm like, yeah. They're like, how come we don't know about that? I go, I don't really talk about it. Right. <laughs> like, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it's great. It pays the bills. It helps fund rare cut. It helps fund like certain parts of my lifestyle. But ultimately, I think when, when people see someone that's pursuing um, their passion or dream, um, it inspires them as well. And it's more mm -hmm. exciting to be like, Hey, you want to hear about contracts and things I'm doing with medical devices or would, you know, it, this opens up kind of more of a discussion and, and people oftentimes will be like, I had an idea for X, Y, Z, and I kind of want to pursue it. So it gets like the wheels turning for a lot of people. And I love to see that. Like, I want people to be inspired and like pursue their passion. So yeah. that's why I lead with rare cut, um, more than anything. And, um, yeah uh it's it's funny you, you kind of nailed it on the head earlier about like what people want to talk about and there's not many follow-up questions but with rare cut i i think uh i've seen quite a few people um launch something of their own and I, i'm not gonna say it's because of because uh, of us but they've followed up with questions and and i love doing that and that's one of the best things you can do as a founder because i got a lot of help from people is when people come to you and just like hey you did this pretty recently. Would you mind helping me with this or giving me an opinion on this? It's just like, that's how you grow as an, as a founder. And yeah. that's how you help others too. It's, it's, it's one of the most rewarding things you can do. And you only do that by spreading the word. So um, people don't talk about their ideas because they don't want to be seen as a liar in case they do not follow up and right. launch. But there's something, there's something uh, to that where you tell someone and you hold yourself accountable and you see it through. So I encourage people to, openly discuss what their projects and goals are because there's a higher likelihood of them following through because of it. Yeah. Like it, if you're asking for help as a founder who maybe even hasn't launched at that point, how do you know, how do you find like the courage to ask for help, um, make use of good advice or bad advice, but then also like be respectful of that other founder's time, um, knowing that we're all super busy. Like how do you find the right people to reach out to? I think, I think people there's, uh, it depends on where they are at in their journey, but I think in order to have a, uh, kind of, um, fulfilled life at some point in time, um, you want to mentor someone. And mm -hmm. I think too, not everyone's going to be the right mentor for you. They might answer a question for you. Uh, I've had people that are just like, 
Um, I've asked to for advice and like put me on your advisory board for this fee. And I passed at that time. Yeah. And then there's other people. It happens. And then that's there's, hard. Yeah, that was harsh. I'm like, oh, I'm just. Well, I mean, I, that's I like a, I get it. Like everyone has to watch out for themselves, but also like, I don't know you. Why are you specifically the person that should be on my advisory board or like something that I should do? I, well, how can I invest in you if I don't really know you? That's, that's pretty ballsy. It is. And, and uh, I got to give a shout out to my buddy, uh, Matt, my buddy, Matt used to work for uh, Damon John. And one of the things that he picked up along the way is when you're asking, when you're asking somebody for something, offer something in return, right? Don't just be uh, um, you know, a taker, but offer something. And one thing that he had done, and I found it to be uh, something that, you know, your audience could definitely uh, gain something from is say, Hey, um, here's where I'm at, here's my company, here's essentially where I need a little help. Uh, in exchange for your time, you know, I would love to in return, uh, either donate um, time or money to your favorite charity. Cool. Let me know what I could do. Cause then because a lot of successful people have a passion project that they really yeah. care about. And if you're gonna, and even more than money, time, time is yeah. the most valuable, valuable asset that we have, most valuable commodity. If you're like, hey, they might be like, hey, you know, what, actually, we're having a walkathon or we're having an event and you know maybe there's a ticket you buy and you go there well now you caught their attention and you're helping them out as well so that's something i would encourage people to lean with it, it, i love that i've never good. yeah i've never heard that approach but that's great right yeah so what are kind of some of the unseen moments the anthony at work moments that people don't see on the highlight reel Oh, uh, figuring out how to make these things was, <laughs> was so was so frustrating. And even once we learned how to make them, we found out there was a better way how to make them. And it's almost like a golfer changing his swing after really? he's got a good thing going on. You're and most people be like, oh, you, you don't change your swing because you, you stick with what you know and you approve upon it. And that was kind of the school of thought I had was just like, well, it took forever to get to this point to make them this way. Mm -hmm. We found a better way. And we leaned into that and it's been a complete, complete game changer. Um, I think that that's one thing. Was it a better thing. way from design perspective or like a monetary way on the back end? No, just, just in, in, in actually manufacturing them. So okay. originally what we were doing, um, and I kind of uh, touched on it a little bit earlier, we would take prints and we put them on a roll and we pre-make them. So we'd have all this extra inventory, but then we switched to the, uh, made to order. And it's just okay. like completely changes the, the business model to like, it's a complete game changer. So, so that's. That's one. I think people will get a kick of when they see when an order actually comes through me. Like it, it's people ask like, Oh, when you get an order, like, what's that feel like? And it's something it never gets old. Like you're like, oh, it, you, you just like kind of jump up from your seat and excitement. It's just, it's, it's a, I don't know. It's almost like you're hitting uh, like you have the ball at the half court line and you're throwing it and it goes in and you're like, yeah, like it's that kind of feeling every time you get a, a new sale and it never gets old. It's one of the most beautiful experiences that I can't even explain. You just have to like live through it. And okay. it's those highs that make this so rewarding. And I think 95% of entrepreneurship is behind the scenes. It's not pretty. I love it, but it's, it ain't pretty. And it's, it's, it's trying to like top your game. It's almost like you're besting yourself and you take things, failures, it, it's on you. You got to figure it out. And it's a lot of tinkering and there's a lot of behind the scenes frustrations that people don't see, but the glory is all in that 5%. And then yeah, that 5% you get the little notification. Like, it's everything. That's all, exactly. That's that 5% makes it all worth it. That 5% makes people, you know, do things of like, Hey, I'm either leaving my job or I'm doing this, or I'm starting up this company. It's all in that 5%. Yeah. The, and I bring that up because I don't want people who are aspiring entrepreneurs to mistake the 5% for being everything. Cause it's just kind of the tip that everyone sees like, oh, that's the tip of the iceberg that it's, you see it from afar, but underneath there's this massive amount of work and um, hardship to a degree, but more so just kind of uh, it's the great unknown and figuring out that 95% is what makes um, a, a company successful or ultimately one that makes or breaks you. And the 5% is getting to do awesome stuff like this, like be on your podcast and have conversations like this, but this yeah. is not the bulk of the job. This is kind of the rewards of the job. Right. Cause you got to keep yourself at a certain level of like positivity in your mindset. Cause 
because of that other 95%. If you're not getting those orders that are rolling in or it's been a minute, I can imagine that it's pretty like, fuck, what is happening right now? Totally, totally. Yeah. It is. And, and you, and you, you know, people would be like, say, don't take it personally. How do you not? It's hard How not to. How do you not? <laughs> it's hard not to. It's impossible. Right. It's very hard. I mean, you do have to like, of course, keep yourself like at check and have like a good crew around you to, to keep you grounded. But at the same time, like this is your baby. It's not like, I don't know anything about medical sales, but I've had corporate nine to five jobs and you're like, mm, I'm shutting things off because it's not my company. And it's right. not that I don't care, but I have other things to do, you know? Right. So well, even on vacation, right. I was bringing, I was bringing these boxes with us on vacation and Did I was you? like, All right, this is, this is coming with me and we're taking videos and pictures. Yeah. I haven't posted them up yet, but, um, you're always like in the back of your mind, like, all right, how, this would be a cool scene to do a, a picture or a campaign or an ad. Like your mind starts working in different ways. And um, if people think like, oh, I don't have that mentality, you don't have to yet, but you will get there naturally. So long as you don't quit and you keep at it and you care, you will develop that mindset. And I think, I don't think you can ever fully shut off. I don't think it's possible. Right. I don't even think it's good to, and I don't mean go on vacation and not relax. But in the back of your mind somewhere mm -hmm. will be your business. And that's that's the life you're committing to if you go into entrepreneurship. Just be advised. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah. from like a marketing and branding perspective, you've got a little bit of a challenge in the fact of you can just be like, Anthony, you look amazing. Like pocket square is killing it. Everything's great. But unless it's you or someone in your family, no one's going to be like, oh, it's rare cut. Like, let me tell you right. all about this. Right. So how do you make a great little impression in the market so that people a find out about it but b like there's organic continued growth um as a company right and that's the challenge right so that's something yeah. i'm still tinkering with and figuring okay. it out because um you know it's one thing if you saw in the pocket square like oh there's an rc or our logos here but the pocket square you only have like an inch or yeah inch no one's like up square. in your face like yeah, oh exactly. let me observe this that's creepy right. and weird Right. Yeah, exactly. So I think what it is, is um, the best way to get that word out is we have, so, I mean, and I don't even ask people, I love when they do, uh, but we get people posting about us a lot, uh, a lot. Like it'll either be our packaging that it's shipped in or this people like doing this and like showing like the packaging itself. So I got it like people, we get really a lot of comments on our, our packaging. So people will post them holding it or opening it. So that kind of organic word of mouth is like the best way to go about it. Mm -hmm. um, but again, to your point, you don't see a branded um, logo on there, but we're also doing other things too. So we, and I'll be well, using, you know, Greek uh, analogies here. It's kind of this, and this was not the intention, but pocket squares are kind of going to be our Trojan horse into okay. the apparel market. Cause if ah. I, yeah. dropping some secrets here i love I it yeah yeah so we there and that was never the intention when we did the um shop local campaign we got a we got a lot of people who were just like i want to support this but i don't wear jackets to work or i don't even right. have a jacket and we or got you're a, lot a woman of, and like a lot of not, females doesn't Actually, have a significant right. other like yeah it, we had a, to your point we had a lot of females that wanted to support too and um a lot of them bought pocket squares. They're like, oh, uh, my jacket from uh, Zara uh, doesn't have a real pocket. It's just a line. And <laughs> like, we yes. want to support. Yes. Yeah. But we've actually had a lot of, of women that have worn it, which we love seeing. Wow. It's, it's okay. A little boss but, lady. I love it. Yeah, for real. Exactly. <laughs> so we had um, a lot of people and many females say, hey, we want to support your company, but it's just not something that we wear. Are you going to come out with anything else? So we're like, hey, why don't we just make some t-shirts like it's in line it's an apparel company why wouldn't we um so we did and the the shop local shirts were a really a huge huge hit and we sourced uh my buddy has a, a shop in the city and he had an inventory of all these shirts over 100 shirts and i put on i don't even really like going to a fitting room and as you know i bought this in 12 different colors or <laughs> so i had to try on all these shirts and find the most comfortable one and we found this really like it's it's truly like the most comfortable shirt I've ever tried on. So I go, and it's, it's more expensive. We're like, you know what, if we're going to make anything, yeah. let's have it be the best. 
So we went there, we got that, and we said, hey, let's see what we're doing. Let's make shop local shirts. And they were a really big hit. Then we did breast cancer awareness, and we made shirts in addition to pocket squares. Um, and we sold a lot of shirts. Um, and same thing, a uh, portion of the proceeds went to the Avon Foundation, which helps for uh, breast cancer research. And we're like, okay, you know what? Let's continue with this trend of offering pocket squares, but also offering shirts as well. We have um, two more coming up in the very near future. It's okay. a little too soon to mention it yet, but that's the direction that we're going in. All and, under and the rare cut brand too, or is that like- under a, the okay. Rare, okay. Correct, under the rare cut brand. And I was like, kind of like, should I just be as niche as possible with the pocket squares? But like, I don't know, people like wearing um, rare cut, the name on the shirt and the shirts, our designers, a great designer, he, he uh, I don't know if he still does, but he worked for Aeropostale oh. um, and he's an excellent designer. So we have cool shirts and I'm like, you know what, this is kind of fitting into our bigger picture type thing. So in terms of people recognizing the brand um, from actual see, actually seeing the name and logo, we'll have the shirts and beyond, but for pocket squares, there's no, this is why it's such an interesting opportunity. There's no company synonymous with pocket squares. There's True. not, yeah. there's really not. Yeah. And we looked at that as just like, oh my God, like this is low hanging fruit. We can have no pocket square companies have packaging, no company pocket square companies totally. have any messaging or taglines or anything. This is like, Let's take this opportunity and seize it. So I think what's going to happen is when people take a picture of themselves wearing it, the, just the tag alone works wonders for us. So that's okay. how we're going to get differentiated because no one else is tagging a random pocket square company, but they do tag rare cut. Right. Very interesting where you're like, you've got t-shirts and then you've got that are casual and then you have an item that can be casual. It like elevates your casual depending on what you're wearing but they're definitely right. different. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so what's, uh, well, first of all, let's not miss the opportunity to kind of plug where people can order Rare Cut. Oh yeah, for sure, thank yeah. you, I appreciate that. Yeah, you can, they can go right to our website, rarecut.com. Are you uh, in stores or, anywhere? I'm sorry, oh, yeah, we are in stores, yes. Okay. We are in several stores. We are in uh, Rothman's in New York City, which mm. was a huge victory for us. Huge. One of my favorite stores. Yeah. So, uh, really cool to be in there. Uh, we're in a few shops in Long Island, more boutique stores. Uh, we are in uh, Hellenic Aesthetic in uh, Astoria, Queens. Um, so we just recently got into there and we've been doing pretty much everything um, exclusively online, okay. but we want to start collaborating with other businesses and um, working with them. And we've been doing that more recently uh, of getting into stores. Um, oh, and I should definitely drop this. Um, we are unveiling very soon uh, that we're doing custom. So oh. one of the things we want to get into are weddings. So we did a wedding party. We put their monogram with their wedding date underneath. Okay. And um, it makes such a good groomsman's gift. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's something that I, we're really excited about. So Tackling the wedding market. That's a big undertaking but if you if you can get it like you're solid that's the way you know we feel like that's the way to go and also like um you know if anyone has a company out there and they're looking to do something say hey for the holidays or for any occasion really we want to put our logo all over the pocket square just reach out to us and uh we can absolutely work something out but for people who are looking to just buy you know a few for themselves uh like i was saying rarecut.com they're normally 65 uh, per, but uh, we're, we're running a special two for 99 plus free shipping. Nice. And uh, yeah, check us out on Instagram too, uh, or even TikTok. We're getting more uh, more of a presence on there slowly but surely, but uh, just it's at rare cut. Always changing. Awesome. Yeah, it changes everything. It well, totally Anthony, is. thank you so much for coming on the come up. Can't wait to continue to watch your come up. <laughs> and yeah, you have to do a LA co collection. I'm gonna... Um, I, I would trust me. I would love to. And I, I, at this point we have, we have X amount of patterns that we feature, but we want to have a collection. We want to be able to bring any pattern anyone wants at some point in the future and make it for you just like that. I think that's the future of this company. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll start with New York city and LA. How about that? I yeah. think those are two good cities. East, to East West coast rival, you know, bring it back like to the nineties <laughs> hip hop. <laughs> yeah. We'll try to keep the pieces best we can, but you never yeah, know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 
Mm-hmm.